Wow, I'm just really in a fussy, emotional, not liking anything, non-hopeful moment. Wow. Why? Sex positive culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is Horizontal with Lila. I'm Lila, and I am horizontal in New York City next to Ollivander the cat. Welcome to Horizontal, the podcast about intimacy of all kinds, recorded while lying down, wearing robes. I know I said that season three would be threesomes all season long, but we will still have the occasional dyad, because... Sometimes, it just works out best that way. In this episode, I lie down with Steve Dean. Steve Dean is a dating expert, a mega connector, an adventurer, a perpetual nomad, and an event superhost. He's the founder of the dating industry consulting firm Dateworking, which you can find on dateworking.com. He stewards workshops, dinners, co-working sessions, and massive meetups like the food court-centered Huga, which means cozy in Danish. Steve Dean intentionally dates people from all different parts of the social spectrum, including those he would never introduce to his friends, in order to understand their perspective on the world. I think he's actually an anthropologist at heart, and dating is the tribe that he studies. He's a quintessential participant observer. His experiences are research. His research is experiential. His brain incessantly crunches data and relentlessly seeks for the most optimal of the optimal outcomes. I've never met a human machine quite like him. One week this February, I had the mean blues, and I reached out to my friend Jillian, patron of the podcast and creator of The Joy List, a weekly compilation of events that one can go to alone and leave with a new friend. I asked her what she was excited about that week, and she rattled off three or so happenings. Then she asked, how about you? And I realized that I wasn't excited about anything that week. I had, in essence, nothing to look forward to. So Jillian decided to fix that. She encouraged me to go to Open Brain, a roving salon for art and ideas, that takes place in living rooms and public parks and spaces in between. This was a living room edition. I almost didn't go. I was just feeling so blah. But eventually, I picked myself up off my bed, dusted off a tango song I used to sing, and showed up. At Open Brain, two things happened in quick succession. I met a man from San Francisco, Michael, who became my lover, and he invited me along to an after-event hang in a hotel lobby in the financial district. There I would meet Steve Dean, who was orchestrating the event. Everyone kept saying his name. Nobody said his first name on its own. He was Steve Dean to everyone. Jillian said, you don't know Steve Dean? Oh, you should know Steve Dean. And so I went along to talk Burning Man with Michael and meet this Steve Dean. When we met, I told him, Jillian said that we should know each other. Steve said, What's your name? Lila, I said. What's your last name? A bit bemused, I said. Donalo? Yep, said Steve Dean. We should know each other. And then we talked intimacy, dating, and why teenagers are having less sex these days until the wee hours. Because I had recently curated my intimate, immersive Valentine's experience at Hacienda Villa, 14 rooms, Steve consulted me about his Love language-themed townhouse full of intimate encounters, the Love Immersive, set for March 30th, and invited me to be a part of it. Knowing that the environment would be overwhelming, potentially magnificent, but definitely overwhelming, I set up a breather space, a closet with a cozy mat, blanket, and pillow, like a child's secret hiding spot, with three headsets programmed with an 11-minute audio experience that I pre-recorded about the upper limits problem. 
catching it in time, and the radical recalibration of rest. The day of the love immersive, Michael was back in town from SF. I hadn't seen him in three weeks, and we had ferocious, pounding sex that soaked all the way through my mattress cover. That night, at the love immersive, juiced up and well-fucked and sex-haired and satisfied, I met my current partner, Patrick. Because Steve Dean is a super connector, I'm now in the most communicative, loving, romantic relationship of my life so far. In this, the first half of our conversation, we talk about VR world, where Steve met Patrick. My tendency to codependency. Steve's dating habits. Whether connection or commitment require compatibility. Optimizing the skill of connection. Dating across 200 different dating apps. Sex on demand. Whether comets are partners, or if they might be more like growth charts. Polyamory as part orientation and part skill set. How relationships are like startups. And the libido-killing cycle that Patrick and I found ourselves in at the outset of our relationship. In other words, come lie down with us in Chelsea, on the island of Manhattan, New York. P.S. Cats were drugged in the making of this episode, and by cats I mean one singular cat, and by drugged I mean with catnip. Still, I thought it was important to tell you. He did it. Red button says record. Oh man, it was everything is coming up live. It was meant to be, Steve, that <laughs> recording that we made, including the tantrum I about the love losing how the recording. that somehow also managed to get destroyed. I know. What, so beautiful. What the fuck? Okay, it was just just for us. I'm going to bring my phone over and leave that on record <laughs> just in case. You want to have a backup. I am I do like hundreds of backups. Last time I recorded a podcast, I had four phones recording it at once. Uh, there is a very, you know, well-fed cat <laughs> <laughs> crawling about on our chests. <laughs> right in the middle. I told you, he's good at triangulating. Right he'll in the go, middle of all the action. <laughs> huh, if there's one person, he'll go right in the middle of your chest. If there are two people in the room, he'll go exactly <laughs> in between both of you. <laughs> no, what a buddy. Hmm. What a needy cat. <laughs> Look at the nice background music of cat For therapy. <laughs> it's like I'm not fully happening? integrated <laughs> across both people. Half, <laughs> like half control cat yourself. across my chest. <laughs> half cat across Steve's oh. chest. <laughs> no cats and dogs love podcasts. They're like, you're lying down. Yes! This is perfect. This is perfect. Been waiting for you. Four to lie down hands in the touching of me at once. <laughs> I like the purring. Oftentimes it'll be like three in the morning, <sighs> and I just like pass out on the couch with the cat on my chest. And then the roommates will be like, what's happening out here? <laughs> oh, it's just a passed out Steve. There are roommates? Yeah. I mean, there's Kelsey and then my roommate Ben. He's whispering sweet purrings in my ear. <laughs> How are we going to make a podcast? <laughs> yes! <laughs> oh, no. Okay, party foul, get over here. <laughs> You're staying with me. Okay. Here we are. <laughs> uh, I feel pressurized. Pressurized? Yeah, I feel pressurized. No, 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 no. I feel, like, comfortable physically. Mm. I feel pressurized because I feel like, oh, we don't have enough time. And, and the first time I fucked it all up. And <laughs> just... <sighs> Thank <sniffs> you.
Ollie doesn't feel pressurized. Channel your inner Ollie. Look at him, he's a little diva prince. That's a great idea. Steve. I don't know even where to start, but I guess we'll start at the beginning again. What are your early memories of pleasure? Ooh. I like how you go right for the jugular to start out. <laughs> well, yeah, you know. I actually do remember the first, well, first slash second time I ever masturbated. I guess it didn't, the first time I ever engaged in sexual activity was actually before I ever learned to masturbate. It was just kind of like experimentation with other people. <laughs> it was kind of cool, just like not really knowing what anything was and trying to fiddle about with random bits being like, what's this? <laughs> Can you set the scene for me? I mean, my memory is hazy about like the timing for everything. It's possible that I did masturbate sooner. I, I remember it must have been like f first grade, maybe age seven uh, or six, however old one is in sixth, first grade. I would lay in bed and just be really annoyed that like my parents and my sister were always fighting and having like screaming bouts and I was just largely ignored, left to like pretend to be asleep. And so I found that like one way to entertain myself, because I obviously couldn't sleep while they're screaming, was to just kind of like do body exploration and find out, you know, what's what's my body feel like today? You know, I don't feel like I can't. I can't do it. What? I can't focus. <laughs> do you want me to put him somewhere else? <laughs> no, then I'm sure there's going to be meowing, right? From the other room. <laughs> now we're getting tail in the face. <laughs> That's exploring the mic. It's very curious. I know. Okay, okay. Hey, buddy. Hey. <laughs> mm. Oh, that's hair. Now you're just like s sitting on hair. <laughs> I could give him some catnip and get him high in the corner. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go get him high in the corner. That's, That's a what, great idea. The Just drug the cat. I love it. Hey, buddy. You want to come get high with me? Oh, yeah. Oh. All right, we got him. Bought ourselves some time. <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I'm feeling super emotional because I met Patrick at the Love Immersive mm -hmm. and just felt so much love and I know there's so much to unpack. So how well do you know him? I've known him for about almost two years, if not exactly two years. I, I looked at my time hop and I noticed that about two years ago was when I first recruited him to join my arts collective. What did you, what did you think about him when you met him and why did you recruit him? And he came in as like a package deal with a couple other people who he was already working with, who were also wonderful humans. and. Mm. They're all super creative, energetic. They brought a perfect energy to the space. We had this big five floor building next to the Empire State Building that we were basically turning into a little like virtual reality fantasy land. This is the VR world. Yeah. I was brought in to build community there. And so it was like a partnership where I had to basically decide, you know, which people need to come in to make this space wonderful and amazing. Mm. And so when I encountered Patrick. He's just like the perfect energy, very excited to like work really hard, put all of his creativity into it. He also just like would light up the room every single time he walked in. Like I'd get excited to know that he's coming in that day. <laughs> he had all sorts of skills, like anything that needed to be like welded or moved or turn like the whole like Wi-Fi for the space. He's like, yeah, I got that. That's easy. <laughs> you know, like everything that, you know, so many little things that I never even knew would be a thing I had to think about, he'd already thought about and was already like taking charge on it. So I was mm. so proud of him, so grateful to have him around. 
I helped um, him rewrite his resume yesterday, no, uh-huh. a couple days ago. That's on there. And he has on the side, it's actually a really beautifully laid out resume. And on the side, there's a gold bar and the header is blue. And on the side, he has his kind of mission statement. Mm-hmm. And I helped him essentially streamline it mm-hmm. so that it was really what he means to say and what he means to be. Yeah. So what we got to was, as an engineer, I build all the things. <laughs> as an interpersonal strategist, the way I build things connects people. The things I build help people connect. Mm. The world gets better when we apply technology to the synergy between humans. Nice. He should also include a quote on his resume from me saying, <laughs> Dear whoever gets Patrick next to work alongside them, I hate you and I'm jealous of you. <laughs> Give him back. <laughs> I miss my Patrick. <laughs> Signed. So sweet. The Stay last tuned. person Patrick worked with. Are you the last very... person? No, actually, no, I'm You're not. You're not the last person. But I feel like this is a common feeling with Patrick. Where it's like, Aww. don't leave. Come back. You're so good at making things do the thing they're supposed to do. <sighs> and he's struggling right now. I hate to see people struggle when they're like angel humans. I who know. Do so much for other people. I know. And he's, you know, trying to figure out, like many of us are, how can I do something that is sustainable, doesn't suck my soul, is what I mean to be doing, or at least towards what I mean to be doing Mm -hmm. in the world. And he's about to move out of his apartment Mm -hmm. with Katya. Mm -hmm. And they've been really, I guess they initiated this separation in December and then really kind of finally, Mm -hmm. I guess, broken up since... January, but still living together, which is a very common uh, New York breakup story. But Mm -hmm. in their case, they've actually been able to forge a friendship out of that, which is kind of amazing and it's really spectacular and impressive to me. He needs a place to live. He's broke. He needs a job. And all of this is happening right now Mm -hmm. when I have met him. The night of the love immersive... He went, he got, kind of got overstimulated and and overwhelmed, and, and he went back to Crown Heights and kind of had a, like a cathartic breakdown mm-hmm. and then wound up walking with this guy on the street for an hour and talking <laughs> about their lives. Uh-huh. And I was with Michael, and we went to a hotel, and that was pretty sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I felt really full, which was quite glorious for me to feel full of affection and attention. And still I had space because neither of them were with me the whole night. And there was a, an expansion and contraction or as Annie Lala would call it, the inhales and the exhales that were naturally happening because both Patrick and I have a tendency towards codependency. Oh, that sounds so silly. Tendency towards codependency. Oh, God. <laughs> There's that potential to just rush in, which I think we did. And it was really exciting. And my friends were saying that I was glowing. And everybody in the house just loved him. And they wanted to talk to him all night. <laughs> and like, they're, they're, uh, he was over for dinner the first time. And then... He was geeking out with Zed and somebody else, or maybe just the two of them, in the kitchen and talking technical things and just, and I loved to see them love him. Mm -hmm. You know, that was really beautiful and heartening to me. I want whomever I love, it would be ideal if the people in my life love them too. You know, that makes things so much smoother, more integrated, Mm -hmm. more easeful. I know you have trouble with that. I do? Yeah. With your partner. I guess. It depends on the day. You said that she's a lot for a lot of people and that you have to be very careful about when you invite other people to be in her presence. And that's a lot of mental calculations you Mm -hmm. have to do. It's exhausting. Yeah. This person's going to be there. Oh, then... Yeah, I'd, I'd still say that she's, like, on the upper end of people I've encountered in terms of, like... 
she can gracefully get along with most people. There are other people that I date who are very much the type who I will not introduce to almost any of my friends because my friends will be like, why, why is this a human in your life? And I intentionally fill my dating life with people from all different parts of the social spectrum. <laughs> because Really? We, yeah. I mean, What I, do you mean? I don't really have that many scruples about who I'm willing to explore and experience things with because I really want to understand myself and other people from many different angles. And I don't like the idea of arbitrarily cutting people out on just because I'm not looking for like a long term committed relationship with a particular person doesn't mean that I don't want to understand how they see the world. I mean, arbitrarily cutting people out. That also doesn't mean you have to be romantic with them just to see the way that they see the world. It depends. If there's someone who I definitively have no intention of bringing into my social network, then the only other pathway, other than physically working together, like on a project, would be some degree of like romantic or sexual involvement. Because like they're not a friend per se. They're not someone I want among my friends. They're not someone who would want to be among my friends because there's no overlap there. But when it comes to still wanting to understand their world, you know, it's it's almost like a, a quiet, clandestine like moment that we will share together. Or we'll like go and hang out at a park for a little while or go and grab a hotel for the night we still get to have an interaction and get to understand the world through each other's eyes with the complete acknowledgement that this is just for us there is no logistical setup in which this can expand to be a thing where like this person's rooted in my life and exists throughout my different friend groups because neither of us want that we just want to understand what it looks like to see the world through each other's eyes. And it's nice when those moments happen. And to, ha to be able to have those moments with people who otherwise would have no reason to ever be in my life. I just don't understand why that has to be romantic. It sort of sounds like you're, you're doing some sort of tantric no preference thing. Like I could date anybody and gain from it or something. More or less. I mean, it is a form of, like, con I feel like connection does not require compatibility. Commitment Whoa! tends to require compatibility. Although, to be fair, for arranged marriages, you're arbitrarily agreeing to commit without necessarily predicting any compatibility to come from it. But I don't know. I, I look at connection as a skill that can be honed. You know, put any two people in a dark room where they can't see anything and with only them in it, and they'll probably find ways of connecting, potentially even physically. So is it that you just want to train yourself to be this mega connector who can connect with anybody in the world? Therefore, you sort of put your body on the line romantically in order to test this? Absolutely. And it's not like a thing that I set out one day, like I want to be able to connect with anyone in the world. I think it's just a skill that's been optimized over time. And part of it is like my profession, you know, like I'm dating across... 200 different dating apps and you never know what you're going to find on some of these apps some of them let you very strategically zero in on exactly who you want and i can predict with almost perfect certainty that if i go on a date with this person from this app we're going to be compatible and it's going to turn into something great and there's other times where i can predict with almost certainty that we are completely incompatible and that we will never be staples in one another's lives but that the experience we craft together, however weird it is, will be memorable and might be something we want to revisit. How are there... There are 200 apps? There's over 4,000 apps. Over 4,000 dating apps? Dating apps, yeah. I thought you said you were active on 80 or something. I'm active on about 60 at a time. And then I have profiles on over 200. And then a lot of them, you know, they come and they go. The average app will fail within a year, so... It's, it's hard to be active on a lot of apps sometimes because they just disappear. They can't sustain themselves. They're not that great. There are some apps that are only for specific purposes. You know, if you're on Sea Captain Date, I don't know how often you're going to be in the market for sea a new captain. Sea Captain Date? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. one? Oh, yeah. Wow. So for you, you have ones that have a higher level of probability of you being compatible with somebody and wanting something ongoing? What are those? Yeah, like, I look to maybe Hinge, OkCupid, 
and then a couple of like the newer apps that essentially apps that my friends build because then I know that the people joining those are like friends of friends to begin with. <laughs> what are those? And because of the friend groups I've been cultivating, I can reliably predict that, you know, almost anyone I meet on this app is going to be the kind of person who has instant compatibility. There's one called Happy Hour that is in alpha slash beta right now. There was a one that a female friend in San Francisco built. I forget the name of it, but it was basically like a landing page for yourself. If you were to make your own personal website for you to be dated <laughs> it was like that she basically let you create your own personals page and then you could sift through other people's pages but it was very social very you know like meant to be shared meant to be viewed it's not like a private profile mm. on a secure website where you need a password to access it it's very much like it's like an instagram essentially it's modeled right. after instagram but it's very clearly for dating so if you made this version of your profile then it's pretty easy for other people to say oh cool, you're my kind of person. And this site makes it super, like they literally connect you via email because you message someone's profile and it takes you directly to like an email thread with them. Self-advertising yeah. for, for dating. But th like those, I can find my people really quickly. But then when I go on sketchier sites, you know, like there's a sex on demand app. So if you go there, you only get a profile photo and no text, no preferences. One photo. One photo could be anything. Oh my gosh, a single photo. I went on a date with someone whose profile photo and like the only thing for her profile was a statue from the Met. That was the photo, but she was three blocks away. So I'm like, you know what? The profiles only last for an hour, three blocks away. I'm like, you know what? It's worth it. I have no idea what I'm going to find, but like hashtag male privilege, I feel safe enough mm. to be able to say, hey, let's meet. In this case, we met at like Think Coffee. So I felt like that was a pretty safe bet, no matter who shows up. And so we end up having green tea together and then sharing dating horror stories. What did she wind up being like? It was really fun, actually. We were not particularly physically compatible, but we were very friend compatible. We had a very closely aligned lexicon. So like we were speaking the same language. It wasn't like I would say things that would instantly trigger her. It wasn't like our political views were super different, where I had to like walk on eggshells when talking. So there was a really natural flow to the conversation. By the same token, you know, this is an app that they're not telling you anything about compatibility. You just get a photo. So I didn't have high expectations of, you know, integrating this person into my life. But as it turns out, like that app happened to predict, not predict, but it happened to provide someone who became a good friend. This person or somebody else? This person, the one we met at Think Coffee. But it's, it's also, on other occasions, provided people who, from the minute I met them, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm never introducing you to any of my <laughs> friends. Like, you are toxic, but you're attractive, and you are game for whatever happens tonight. And so, in those cases, you know, uh... I'm not going to turn that down. I'm not going to forego the opportunity to experience connection and learning and personal growth, even with someone who I may otherwise not want to spend a lot of social time with. You know, like your political preferences, your cultural preferences, they do not negate your sexual capacity. How and so you... when it comes to when it comes to connecting with someone like I what? Well, how do you grow from engaging in this with this toxic person without being toxicized, <laughs> without being tainted in some way by that toxic energy? For me, it's like the same reason why I'm willing to listen to conservative podcasts, even though I'm pretty diehard as a liberal. You know, like I, I like to understand and grapple with how other people understand the world. And I like to give them space to share very vulnerably, like how their views came about. And I like to understand how they interface with the world. So just because you have different political views from me doesn't mean that you're incapable of getting into your body and really experiencing intimacy and moments of like shutting off the ego and just being present. And I think that that's, like I said, connection is a capacity. It's a skill. It's not something that having certain political or social views renders you incapable of doing. You can still connect. And that's what I always find fascinating that some of my partners are so like my, my existing partners that I commit to very fully that I'm with every day those partners hate some of my other partners because they're like, why would you ever date that person? They suck so much. And for me, it's like, I don't befriend them. I'm not, you know, inviting them over for you know, dinner with all my friends. But we have a dynamic. We have a rapport. And but it they're exists. daily partners? 
No, not necessarily. They could you be just long said, distance. Partners that you see every day. Well, no, the partners that I see every day tell me this about these other one-off partners who they hear about or encounter randomly. Oh, see, I'm thinking of the word partner very differently. I, I don't think of a one-off situation as a partner. Well, it could be like, I see this, I met them on a sex app. They were in town for that week. They won't be in town for another six weeks or six months or two years. But we stay in touch. And so if six years go by and I see this person, you know, once every five to ten months for six years straight, we have consistency to it. We mm -hmm. have a sense of, like, what our identity looks like. And one of the coolest things about it is that we get to understand how we mirror one another. So, like, when we meet up again, the question becomes, like, are we still, like, who, who are we now relative to who we were last year? Do we still have the same preferences, the same boundaries? Do we like have our have our <laughs> views changed? Could we be friends it's yet? It's like oh. a growth chart on the wall, like marking yeah. the height on the wall. It's so cool because you don't really get that with your friends because you see them all the time potentially yeah. and you don't have that ability to check in. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about also being sexual partners is that like sometimes when you meet after a year, they may have had like multiple other partners in between. They may have had a serious monogamous relationship. Between, like I've had that happen before where a partner of mine who I was with for like two or three years, but only seeing a couple days a year, would go into a monogamous relationship. And I say like, yeah, go for it. You do you. Like, live your life. I support that. And then like three years later, when we haven't really engaged over that time period, I get a message from them out of the blue being like, hey, you know, out of that relationship, I'd like to see you again. And I'm like, sweet. <laughs> I, it's for me, I'm not looking at that as like, oh, wow, I'm like leftovers that they decided that they're desperate enough to go for it's more that we both mutually see this as a cool opportunity to find out like who we are now and so you know maybe they liked being choked three years ago mm. and that was like really hot for us maybe now three years later i can't assume that that's still a preference they have or that that's something they'd still consent to i don't have privileged access to them anymore like that's not a thing i can assume and so it teaches me to constantly use the skills of like verbal communication checking in with someone it teaches both of us to renegotiate boundaries and to understand who we are compared to who we remember us being and i find that to be so powerful i would call them comets yeah and they come around a certain you know at certain intervals yeah they come back around it seems like you approach everything as a conscious experiment like it seems like your polyamory is really just an exercise in stoicism, not because you really want to be polyamorous. Well, for me, I, I still consider polyamory to be part orientation and part skill set. So for 21 years, I didn't know what it was like to be polyamorous because I was a devout monogamous person. And so after I began practicing, it was really hard in the transition phase of like two to three years between identifying solely as monogamous to identifying solely as polyamorous. It involved a lot of skill building, a lot of understanding how to be compersive, what that felt like, how it integrated with my existing mental models of how the world works, how other people work, how relationships work. And so as I developed the skills, I stopped thinking of polyamory as just like a set of skills because it became so integrated into my like my core OS, how my brain functions, how I perceive the world, my immediate priors when anything happens. Like my partner says, hey, I'm having a date tomorrow night and I get excited now. That used to be a devastating thing to hear. And now it's like, I get overjoyed. I'm like, oh my God, tell me everything. Can I help? Can I make it even better? You know, is this a good person? Like, do you have history with them? Are they going to make sure that they treat you right? Do I need to have a talking to you with them? Make sure that they know where your clit is. Like, you know, all of these things where I now am so excited about it, but that's like, it's now become essentially my orient, my relational orientation rather than just the skill set that I have. How did you train yourself to be compersive? I think the, I think the number one thing that I'm not going to call them muggles, that people who are, who are not open to expanding, oh, I don't want to say that either. I don't, because I don't want to put a value judgment on it. I think that the number one concern for people who are not experienced with loving multiple people romantically and sexually at the same time is that they won't be able to handle the jealousy and that they don't actually feel compersion. They don't actually feel 
joy if their partner is flirting with somebody else or going on a date with somebody else. I think that a they, lot even of, imagining it for them yeah. is, is even as a thought exercise, they can't conceive of a way mm -hmm. that they could be rewired. I think it's completely natural to feel that way. And it's mostly for lack of priors. So think about it using the framework of like a startup analogy. Like most, Oh, I love it when you say this. Okay, we talked so, about this one. So a relationship is like a startup. So like most people think about it in terms of I, I want my co-founder. I want the person who's going to build this thing with me. And I can't even conceive of having another person there because in society we usually just... Like, if monogamy is the default, everyone just has one person, they're looking for one person, the idea culturally of having multiple people feels like it's automatically cheating, or you're getting shortchanged, or you're, like, you only have a finite number of, think about it in, like, equity perspective, you have, like, everyone thinks 50-50 is the only possible way to split relationship equity. <laughs> and to be fair, when you think about, like, the slippery slope argument, if you have 10 primary partners then you're each sticking around like with 10% equity and maybe there's a weird yeah. split there. So like when My you look at it that way, you're like, okay, no investor is going to touch that relationship. It's kind of gross. Like there's no one has enough equity to feel truly committed to what's happening here. And Michael talked about that. He said that he only recently realized that he was running something that was sort of like a minimum viable relationship and that it wasn't working. Yeah. And like even with, like I'm in a relationship where it started out where I told my partner, I can't afford to give more than 20% equity in anything that I'm doing because it's already allocated across all of my existing relationships and projects. So like my attentional equity, there's literally no more than 20% available. Because and that so, is limited. And they talk about yeah, that in the ethical like, slut, right? The things that are actually limited are your time mm -hmm. and your energy. And so what happened was as we started to spend more and more time together, and she made it really easy to spend time together because she's like, hey, you're welcome to my place anytime you want. Uh, I'll show up at events with you because we had so many shared interests and so many shared friends. So it was just easy to spend more time together. So it didn't feel like it was costing that much because it wasn't like we had to plan intentional right. time. It just happened because we both kept showing up at exactly the same events. And so as we escalated, it got to the point where we were spending a solid like five days a week together. And so we had a really fun challenge where suddenly we have what looks like almost like a 50-50 equity split in a relationship. But I was still of the mindset where it's like, I have these other partners that deserve my attention and my care. And as I spend more time with this one partner, I just had less of that attention available. And so I was holding out on her for the equity for a while. I was basically saying like, this is not the relationship you think it is. This is not what I need this attention, this equity freed up for the other things that I care about. And then it got to a point where she's like, all right, here's the deal. You can say mm -hmm. that I don't have equity in this relationship, but the fact of the matter is, like, we're here together six days a week. <laughs> you know, like, you can deny it all you want, but that equity is vesting. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> and so we had this point of reckoning about a year ago, a little over a year ago, where I had, like, a come-to-Jesus moment where I was like, oh, shit, like, I've been, if I continue to declare that you're only at 20% equity when I'm spending six days a week with you. And like, I'm just gaslighting you at this point. And she called it like that. She's right. like, this is, this is, feels like gaslighting. And I was like, well, shit. What happened was that my understanding of who I was and what relationships I was available for, I had predetermined that. I said like 20% is where everyone maxes out in my life because I'm a super connector. I'm all over the place. I mm. need to free up that space for anyone who shows up. I never know when partners are going to be in town. They're all over the world. And so I need, I, I don't want to have a situation where I'm investing so much in one partner that my other partners who I've been with for years suddenly show up and I'm like, oh, well, I'm with my other partner, so I can't hang out with you. They're like, I'm only here once a year. I thought we had like a thing going on where we get to we prioritize seeing each other. So I don't want to like dilute their shares in our relationship just because another partner came on board and happened to you know, take up more space, more attention. But isn't that how things change? Things well, just so, change. But I mean, this is where we're going back to the topic of people who are monogamous and haven't really conceived of equity splits. <laughs> the easiest simplification is that, you know, you're alone. You have 100% control of your own personal agency. You decide for yourself where you want to be and when. But that's frustrating because you don't have a partner. You have no one to connect with. When you get a partner, most people assume, okay, there's only... You know, 50 and 50, we're done. We, we found each other. This is it. And in polyamory, it's not that simple because there is no such thing as an immediate assumed 50-50 split because a lot of poly people 
are already polysaturated. They already have so many partners that their equity is already going all over the place. And there's an added layer of complication to this. Like, it's not just like you have a finite pool of equity because there, I can just bring in the topic of Elon Musk. We have someone who has <laughs> multiple startups. So like, if you have a relationship in which you and your partner consider yourselves 50-50 equity holding partners in that relationship, in that case, you don't have like a third partner for that dynamic, but you could independently have another separate relationship with a separate person where you have your own equity splits with that person. And so you can run multiple parallel relationships. But the challenge here, just as the challenge of running a startup is like, if you're CEO of a startup, you need to be on the phone. You need to be there. You need to be the one that people turn to, to help, you know, navigate what's going on, set the vision. And it's really hard to run multiple startups. And it's, that's where it takes such skill and such finesse and you have to have the right team for it. And you have to have the, you know, like most people would never want to do that. It's like a superhuman capacity and it's hard enough for most people when they think about like a lot of people are single, you know, half of people are probably single, if not more. I think it's over 50% in the US right now. Right. So most people don't even run one. The idea of getting a single startup, getting a single relationship where they can have a partner is already like the end game. That's the thing they're striving toward. So when poly people say like, oh yeah, you know, it's just like five or six juggling partners, seven partners, all these different styles. Monogamous people are like, what on earth? Earth. It sounds like Are juggling. It really about? does. It sounds like a like where's a the focus? Barnum and Bailey <laughs> juggling act. To be honest, like in the absence of Google Calendar, it would feel like that. <laughs> at least with Google Calendar, you just give everyone access and you say, you know, mark the date on your calendar. Let's make this easier. It, oh, that's interesting. It makes life so Shared much easier. Shared Google calendars oh God, with yeah. all your partners. Yeah, so, so the, all your partners see you when you're with another partner. I mean, it's not that they have to necessarily see it. They just like in an ideal world, like when I was operating within a very high functioning polycule of like 15, 20 people who are all dating one another in various configurations. We did have the ability to rapidly see where everyone's going to be, what they're up to. You know, there was such an effortless acceptance of everyone's priorities of like, Hey, I'm with this person tonight. And then everyone else would be like, cool. Do you want company or is it just for you two tonight? And then they'd be able to say, well, no, we'd, we'd love to have a couple more people join. This is how much space we have. And then everyone else would essentially say, oh, well, I'm close and I could join right now. And they'd say, cool. And we'd have this all at the same chat thread with like 15, 20 people in it. Wow. So it worked effortlessly. I think one of the things it seems like is that would suddenly take over all of your life. <laughs> My dad has a theory that, you know, sex, relationship, that should only be about 20% of your life. Mm hmm. I don't know, you know, that's dad's theory, <laughs> right? But it seems like having multiple relationships, if you're really attending to them mm -hmm. and you're really, you're running your startups in mm -hmm. a very hands-on kind of way yeah. and you're present for your people and you're showing up, it seems like it would take up something like 90% of your attention and you'd have about 10% for your work and your self-actualization and your... Personal you might think growth. that, but he here's a counterpoint that I found satisfying. There are times when within my polycule, you know, you think, according to your model, having 15 people in a parallel relationship is overwhelming and takes up a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. I would argue that it's the best thing to ever have saved my attention because when my any one of my partners says, hey, I'm having a really rough day at work today. Is there someone I can call to talk through it? I'm not the only one on the hook. Mm. When I'm in a 50-50 equity holding relationship with a partner and mm. they have a bad day, guess who they call? It's me. I'm their co-founder. <laughs> like, I don't have the ability to say, hey, can someone jump in for me here? I'm tapped out. When you have 15 people in the relationship, you can instantly say, hey, I'm tapped out right now. Can someone make sure that my partner is cared for? Because I guarantee there's someone else's partner in this thread too. So... Mm. Like, you just have this instant community support. And so I, I, I hearken that back to, like, our hunter-gatherer roots where we're just having tribal. children in tribes. And, yeah, it's whoever is available takes care of the kids. It's not that only the mother or only the father can take care of the kid because a lot of times they didn't know who the father was. Right. And so and that didn't matter because everyone's taking shared responsibility to make sure that everyone in the whole collective is cared for. And mm. that was such... Of relief for me because it helps you recognize that hey sometimes in life you know it's not fair 
a lot of shit can get dumped on you at work or in mm-hmm. life. You go through family trouble. And it shouldn't be the case that only... You only have one, one person to rely yeah. on. Yeah, and like this is why investors don't... They rarely will want to touch startups with only one co-founder. Mm. Because it's like if your life suddenly, like, you know, your parents die or some horrible thing happens, mm. like, where do you go? How does this startup continue functioning in the absence of the person driving it? Right. And so I like when relationships have multiple stakeholders. It's not to say that I want 50 people in the same relationship because then it's so diluted that... You almost need an engine for pulling more people into it to keep it going because no one has enough equity to stick around very long. Mm. And anyone else who's like, hey, how about I offer you 30%? And they're like, oh, that's actually pretty good. I'm only getting 2% right now. Define what the equity is. The equity is the sense of investment in the relational dynamic. So if I'm in a monogamous partnership, I'm fully invested with my partner. Like the two of us are the only contributing members to the functioning of this relationship. There's no one else who's in it. It's just us. If someone wants to invite, like if I'm in a monogamous partnership and someone wants to invite me to their birthday, it might be really weird for them to not invite my partner because we're like an entity. We yeah. operate, we, we subsumed oh, our I've egos had a lot of that as into a the we concept. Uh, and so now, and, and it can be like infuriating because uh, if someone has a partner where you're have like, her without inviting yeah, him. Because like, uh, then like your partner uh, can actually be a huge drag on your social life because suddenly like if it's assumed that you always operate as a unit, then anyone who doesn't like your partner suddenly like can't actually have quality time with you because you have subsumed yourself into the relationship. Mm. Your equity has vested. You are now you know, no longer fully your own person. You are now a representative of this we concept. Which is and a codependent version of relationship, codependent version of monogamous relationship Yeah. rather than co-commitment, mm-hmm. which is I'm rereading Conscious Loving mm-hmm. with Patrick. And thinking about that journey towards co-commitment mm-hmm. where each person is fully moving towards their own self-actualization. And, and I think that's what's happening right now is this. I've pulled back a bit because I started to feel a dynamic that I have had with my mother, which is her leaning, wanting more from me, more energy from me than I, mm-hmm. than I have or, or not being able to give what they're expecting when they shower you with love or something like this. Mm -hmm. And it's affecting my sex drive. Mm -hmm. And I feel scared because I really do feel a lot of love for him. And I would like to explore relationshiping. And I know that if the sex drive is not there, it's going to be a very different form. Mm -hmm. And I felt really attracted the first night that he came over and we had sex and it was great, not because mechanically it was really great, but because Mm -hmm. I felt so connected and seen. And so I've been checking in with myself. Is it because I'm not used to feeling met? Mm -hmm. I'm not used to feeling seen. I'm used to choosing people like Michael who are available for a certain amount, have extremely strong boundaries Mm -hmm. and mm, the burden, burden, but you know what I mean? of drawing my own boundaries is not on me Mm -hmm. because I choose people Mm -hmm. who have so many other things in their lives or such strong boundaries that I don't have to enforce my own because I'm never getting as much as I would want from them. I'm never saturated. Mm -hmm. So I never have to be the, I really think that's what I've done. So I don't have to be the person who draws the boundaries. And it's so challenging to look at and to grapple with Oh, I want to help him, you know, I posted about some sort of, maybe there's some sort of pet sitting thing he can do where he can have a place to be for a while and, and not be spending. And, and you want to be able to help your partner, but there is a, because of my tendencies mm-hmm. and his to look for somebody who's going to nurture him and mine to not draw my own boundaries and to, try to help in a way that mm-hmm. that depletes me and now has turned off my yeah. my sex drive, that's not going to be good for us. And so I'm grappling with this. I have this desire to take care of him. And I actually took it. I, I told him that the night that we met at the Love Immersive, I said, I have this impulse to take care of you. I didn't know where it came from, mm-hmm. but I spoke it because it was really present. And he said, thank you for telling me that that affirms something that I've just really learned about myself. And he doesn't want that. He doesn't want to 
put other people in this role of caretaker Mm -hmm. or put, let's say, the women that he's romantically and sexually involved with in this role of caretaker. But also, I want to help this person who's so lovely. and, And this week also I feel quite... I've scheduled so many things this week that I... I care about and and there's things that I feel I must get done like taxes <laughs> and and I feel a sense of overwhelm and that shuts down my libido even more. You need naked taxes where the reward <laughs> is sex. That'd be great if I was turned on, right? <laughs> but if I'm not feeling turned on, then I want to have sex. You get more turned on with each additional line item you complete because you're closer to... <laughs> anyway, I did it last last night by myself uh. until 3 a.m. So it's done <laughs> and I'm bleary-eyed. Uh. But, but you know, the, the things that also are trying to move me towards the things I want to be doing in the yeah. world. And I know that my codependent tendencies can be to put those things aside, move them, reschedule yeah. them. And that's not that's not going to be good. Yeah. And mm. so we had a conversation on the phone the other night where it was like, well, maybe we need to hold off on this, on diving in here until he's in a more stable place. Mm-hmm. A place where I don't feel like I'm going to need to feed him and pay for things and take him out and, and get him a job and find a place to live. And mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to grapple with I keep using the word grapple. I'm trying to, uh, with, oh, but I want to help. What's a, what's a healthy version of helping? What's, an, what's yeah. a non-codependent version of helping this person who's so lovely, whom I love? And maybe it is actually taking space and saying, when you're in a state like this, it's not conducive to our growth together, our co-commitment yeah. growth the way, together. The way I look at that is like, neither of you currently have a like vested equity in your own startup your own personal one because that's how a lot of people start out like you have your own relationship with yourself and i would not say that i don't have vested equity in my own self well you're afraid that you'd quickly dilute your own shares in your personal startup in order to free up time and availability for this new thing with someone else who would essentially do the same thing at the drop of a hat mm. and the idea that you're not confident enough in your own ability to maintain boundaries indicates to me that despite the fact that you would say you're really committed to your own thing, you're afraid that you would quickly prioritize uh, someone else's thing over yours. Because if you were, if you had vested equity in your own thing, this wouldn't even be a question. You'd be like, sorry, dude, this is how much availability I have. This is what I want to invest. And beyond that, I can't give that to you. Can't Thanks. help you. Go <laughs> figure it out yourself. Yeah, it's like, I'm, I've got Friday. I don't have any other days. I've got Friday. If you need other things consult other people there may be a time in my life when i can free up i can you know like tone down the other things and projects i'm working on and the other you know emotional space i'm currently reserving for myself in order to free it up for someone else maybe that's you maybe that's someone else who knows but right now these are the things that i'm committed to he has been seeing a lover for three months and she did not enter into a relationship or a partnership with him thinking that she wanted any kind of Mm non-monogamy, but also knowing that he wasn't going to be the person to settle down with her and have kids now. Mm -hmm. And so they had an idea that it would be finite, but then she, when he met me, she realized, oh, but it actually is not going to turn into what I want right now. You know, I think, I think is what happened with her. Mm -hmm. And then she, they were fluid bonded she asked him to use condoms with me until things kind of scan out, Mm -hmm. which we did and have. And he said that he, the other day when I was at his place, he said that he had the impulse to just focus on me sexually. And I got scared. And I I said, I don't want you to, Mm -hmm. I don't want you to give up your partner, she may or may not want to have sex with him again mm-hmm. now that he's having sex with somebody else. So she has her own agency and her own choices to make. Yeah. But I was concerned about him giving up that connection when I'm not feeling aroused. Yeah. Did you voice that? Yes. Good. <laughs> That's a really important thing to voice. Yeah, I did. And because I don't want him to have those needs unmet and for me to feel even more pressure mm-hmm. than I'm currently 
placing on myself. <laughs> you know, it's not like mm-hmm. it's not like he's really placing pressure on me, but I'm like, oh my god, we've just met. It should it yes. should be really <laughs> fucking hot right now still. You this know? is the problem when you so like it, I feel like it gets so hot when you have the ability to freely commit to whatever makes the most sense and you don't have existing like it's not like you have this huge ship of life that you have to like turn around in order to fit the trajectory that this new person has introduced. But I think a lot of us, especially in Polly, you have so many ongoing overlapping commitments and connections that anytime there's a new person, they have to first respect what exists, what you've committed to. And I think that that's like a sign of extreme emotional and relationship maturity. When you check in with someone and say like, Hey, what are you currently committed to? Is, you know, like your chosen directionality of your attention. Where do you currently choose to spend your attention? Right. I'm struggling with the word commitment because I wouldn't say that I have made a commitment to Michael, but I did express to Patrick that I didn't want to give that up, that I didn't want to give the time that I had with Michael up. And it's it's not just with other people. It's with other projects. It's with, you know, like for for me, the biggest challenge. Where is your energy going right now? What are you, what are you invested in? What is. And it's also, what are, what are the opportunities that you're intentionally leaving space for? Because like for me Mm. as a nomad of eight plus years, I specifically told any and all partners, like, here's the deal. I don't know where I live tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I live in a week or in a month. There are no things on my calendar. There are no places I know that I will be. If you ask me to commit to a vacation with you in two weeks, I can't. If you ask me to commit to moving in with you, I can't. I have no agency whatsoever over where I'm going to be. And consequently, if you expect... What do you mean no agency? You have all the agency. Technically, I have... Well, no, because I couldn't afford to pay for anything. I couldn't afford a hotel room. I couldn't afford even a hostel sometimes. I live very much well below the poverty line right. using only social capital. And with social right. capital, you don't get the predictability of knowing, oh, I can just, you know, yes. hop into a hotel if I need it. You know, I think that's the biggest difference between nomads who have already made a bunch of money and can yeah. just like float around living in Bali, doing whatever they need to do. Like you can live in a place that's low cost of living, but you still need to be able to get there and get back. Yeah. I never, I usually, I've gone years having less than a thousand dollars cash on hand. Mm-hmm. And that has to last me for months at a time, mm-hmm. many months. And so doing that means I'd leave, like, I entirely rely on social capital. I need to be able to message a thousand people at once, say, mm-hmm. who needs a cat sitter, dog sitter, apartment right. sitter, who's around. Sometimes it's like, who am I currently dating who would prefer that I'm with them that right. night? Because then I don't have to do anything with social capital. I'd simply find partners who already want me there. Yeah. And so... That's how I did my first cross-country road trip in 2008. Yeah. It was all social capital. Oh, this this teacher, the Sacra Yoga teacher is coming to town. You know, but you don't know what's going to happen. For family like or you, friends, or yeah. If someone said, "Hey, can you commit to this?" I'm like, "Hell no! I I don't <laughs> commit to anything myself. Like my own shit is all up in the air." So, but the is idea, it still that way now? Well, you did the love immersive. That was planned that was a month committing. In advance. No, but the reason for that is because I had to go through this excruciating two plus year process with my current partner, where I had to learn because, like, when she called me out saying, "Like, look, you're you've." spent six days this week at my apartment with me having a wonderful time this space is not 20 percent yeah like bullshit you can reliably tell me right now that if you wanted to be here five days from now like i have an open door for you and so the fact that she offered up that space she's like i'm giving you the ability to commit because i'm saying that this space is reserved first for you like you are my first commitment Hmm. and that did two things. One, it will actually allowed me to commit to longer term things because I could reliably say, like, I'm at, I'll be at my partner's space when needed. But the caveat to that, and the thing that was devastating to my other relationships, is that when I have a partner choosing to offer up her space to me on an indefinite basis, that means that she can't just say, like, oh, I have a date tonight. I'm going to go use my own room for that date. Bye, Steve. You're out in the street tonight Mm. you know like she forewent the ability to have impromptu dates in order to preserve both of our you know relational health together right but what that meant to prioritize you to prioritize me and so when she did that i was actually like it was both a relief and an insane frustration because the relief is like oh wow i have now some degree of like housing security Mm -hmm. but the frustration is like now if i want to use social capital to stay at someone else's place i can't because i'd have to give my partner forewarning hey like i'm not coming home tonight 
And she deserves to know that. Because for a while, I would fight her on that. And I'd be like, hey, if my partner's in town, I'm going to go see the partner. And she's like, well, you should tell me so that I can see my partners. Well, what's the problem with telling her? Why can't you just tell her? Because she likes to have a couple days notice to plan. Like, if she just finds out, like, you know, 3 p.m. day of, like, hey, turns out my, my partner's in town. Like, so it feels if I like... tell her that, then she's like, well, what the hell? I have no time to plan. I was intending to spend tonight with you and talk through some things. Right. And so, like, we basically started to realize we can't live serendipitously in this context in which we've made a commitment to one another. And for me to not be able to live serendipitously completely attacked my identity. Next week's episode will be the second half of my conversation with Steve Dean, in which I ask him for dating advice about my own relationship. It is available to patrons only. You can become a patron of the Horizontal Arts and gain access to the part twos from every episode, as well as an invitation to the Secret Patrons Facebook group and a monthly video of intimacy tips by going to patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. That's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash horizontal with Lila. This episode was edited by Chad Michael Snavely from chadmichael.com. The horizontal jingle was created by Alan Markley, Plastic Cannons on Instagram, and Sexy Cartoon Me was illustrated by Shauna Shea, whom you can find on 99designs. If you'd like all the horizontality in your inbox, I do send extremely intermittent emails with information about my live events. For instance, stay tuned for one coming up on June 30th at Hacienda Studio in Bushwick. The emails also have behind-the-scenes photos and other things of a horizontal nature, like when I guest on somebody's sex blog or somebody else's podcast. You can sign up for that on horizontalwithlila.com. Until next time, I wish you someone or someones to love, something to do, and something, at least one thing, to look forward to. This week, I'm looking forward to a cuddle party and a day trip to the beach with my partner and my friends. Thank you for getting horizontal with us. I could give him some catnip and get him high in the corner. Okay.